Good morning, everybody. It's a little bright up here. It's dark right on there. How is everyone doing today? I'm obviously, I'm obviously not Pastor Tyrone. Um, definitely not. So um, he is on taking a much needed break today, taking some rest, him and his wife, and just enjoying some uh, a day off. So um, he loves you all very much and wanted to say welcome to those of you if you are a guest. Um, my name is Vanessa. I'm the youth pastor here. And um, I, it's my pleasure to get to share with you this morning. I'm very excited about it. Um, so I'm super stoked. Um, I'm used to speaking to teenagers, not adults. So forgive me if it's not quite as eloquent as you would think. But no, I'm just kidding. Hey, real quick, though, too, about the men's hike. Um, if those of you that are interested and have more questions, Abijah, can you raise your hand for me? That, that is the, the gentleman that is running the hike. Um, if you have questions about the hike, come talk to, go talk to him before service ends, because it is on Saturday. So if you have questions, you need to know before you leave today. So find him after service and go talk to him, and he will gladly answer any questions you have about the hike. And so I just wanted that you all to know where to go. But um, it's crazy because today is the last day of 2017. Does anybody else think the year has, like, flown by? I'm like, oh my goodness, it's almost, to me it was crazy, we were, me and my husband were sitting home and I was like, it's almost Christmas, and I was like, it's almost the end of the year, like it's, it's insane how time has just flown, um, and this last year, man, I'm, I think of the blessings of life, like this church and our amazing pastors, man, I love pastors Tyrone and Amy so much, they're incredible leaders and mentors in my life, and I know those of you that are here love them dearly, and so um, I want to honor them because they're pretty incredible and pretty awesome pastors, and I think that we're blessed to serve them and, and this church, and so obviously I'm also blessed for each one of you, like I, I think of where God had us, me and my husband, we've been here now for a little over a year. Um, I think a, a little, I mean, maybe a year and a half, maybe, but we haven't been here very long. Uh, but since I've been here, I've just been blessed to know such great people. And it's been an honor to serve and to be with you guys and hang out and just to be here. And then also, you know, it's a year that God decided to grow my family. You know, I have my daughter coming in a couple months and I'm super stoked about her making her way into the world. She's going to be cute. We got the ultrasound and the 3D ultrasound, which to most people is really creepy, but I guess when you're a mom, it's not so creepy because... <laughs> You're like, oh, look how cute the little, well, Debbie, Debbie said to me, the little blob, like, look at the cute little blob. But, you know, it's, it's crazy how, like, you can see so much features in, like, a little ultrasound. But, it, yeah, you know, most people, or it was, I think it might have been Shay, kind of creepy. <laughs> kind of creepy. But I'm like, you know, I, I, if I were the other end of it, I would say the same thing. It is kind of creepy, but I'm a mom, so I think it's really cute. So I'm good at that. Um, so, so it's just been a good year. Um, and for me, but, but I would say that it's not been the, the easiest year, and I think sometimes we think of, you're like, man, you've had a great year, but I've not had a great year. My year's been kind of crappy, and so today I want to focus on how do we make 2018 the best year? How do we live in God's promises and his blessings in this next year in our life? Um, and I've been praying really a lot about what God wanted me to share, so I hope and I pray that what I speak today really will, will take it to heart. And I pray that God will use it in your life in a really cool way. And so join me in prayer really fast. Lord, I thank you. I love you, Lord. I give you these words, this message, Lord. I ask that you penetrate hearts. And I ask, God, that you do a work, God, that only you can do, Lord. And we thank you and praise you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Man, worship team, blessing in my life today. I just want to say that too. Y'all did good. I, yeah, it was good. And so uh, one of my favorite books is the book of Acts. I absolutely love the book of Acts, okay? Um, the story of the Pentecost is such an amazing story. And I'm going to read a lot of scripture here in the beginning. And it's just to set the scene for what I'm going to talk about. I want to set a timeline for each one of you. And so if you have your Bibles, you can open them up or you can read it on the back behind me. Louis will have it up on the screen. We're going to open up to Luke 24, starting in verse 45. It says, then he opened the minds to understand the scriptures and said to them, Thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead. And the repentance for the forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in the name to all nations beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. And behold, I am sending the promise of my Father upon you. But stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. Okay? That's the first portion. The next portion we're going to go into 1 Corinthians. Starting in verse 15. And this is Paul speaking. Sorry, I'm going to jump around, guys. So I'm going to jump around a little bit, just in the beginning, because I just got to, I want to get the timeline for you all. Um, it's 1 Corinthians 15, starting in verse 3. 
It says, for I deliver to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scripture, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time. Remember that, 500, okay? 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive. Though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James and to the apostles. Last of all, to the one ultimately born, ultimately born, he appeared also to me. Okay, we're going to jump into Acts now, okay? Acts 1, starting in verse 1. On the first book, O Theopolis, I cannot ever pronounce his name, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day when he was taken up after he had given commands through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. He presented himself alive to them after, he, after his suffering by many... Um, apo- I'm sorry, by many proofs appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. And while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you heard from me, for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, it is not for you to know the time or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority. Okay, we're going to continue in Acts, then in verse 13. Okay, stay with me, guys. I promise. It'll, it'll make sense. And when they had entered, they went up to the upper room where they were staying. Peter and John and James and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew, Matthew, James the son of Ephesus, and Simon the zealot, and Judas the son of James. All these with accord were devoting themselves in prayer, together with the women and mother, Mary the mother of Jesus and his brothers. In those days, Peter stood up among the brothers the company of persons was about 120. Okay, so if you remember, read it recently, we went with 500 people that were told to wait, and then there's 120 that were there. Okay, and this is, they went, and this is when they were going into the upper room to receive um, the Holy Spirit that God told them to wait for, the promise, right? And then Acts 2, 1 through 4, this is the day of Pentecost. When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place, and suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues as a fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. And when they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues, as the Spirit gave them utterance. You're pregnant? Yeah, it's harder to breathe. Those the ladies in this room that maybe know that, okay. Um, so this is the timeline. So starting in verse Luke, you got Luke, Corinthians, then you go into Acts. And Luke and Corinthians, it's a preceding, and it's basically, and the Acts confirms all those things that were said in Luke and 1 Corinthians. And it leads us to the thousands of people being converted the day of Pentecost, which starts in Acts verse 2, or Acts chapter 2. And so Paul says that Christ appeared to 500 at once, right? Then on the day of Pentecost, there were 120 in the upper room actually waiting for Jesus. So he said that for 500, I need you 500 to wait. Okay, and hang out. You know, I'll be here eventually. Do your thing. But wait for me. Wait for the promise. And then all of a sudden, the day of Pentecost comes and there are 120 waiting. So my question is, where did the 380 go? Because originally there were 500 that were supposed to be in that upper room, right? To receive uh, the Holy Spirit, to move on the kingdom of God, to move on his, his promises. Um, but yet they're not. And so the Bible doesn't say what happens to 380 people. It doesn't like give you a deciphering. It doesn't give you an account of them. But I can't help but wonder for myself, um, did they just get tired and did they get impatient? Because, I mean, God didn't say, I'm coming tomorrow. God said, just wait. It's not for you to know the time. It's only for me to know the time. Um, and I think about that often. And I think Acts 1-7 says that it's not for us to know the times or the season, but the Father has fixed things for his own authority. We don't know how long they were told to wait. We were just, told that we were just shown that they were told to wait. Okay? I'm, I'm first to admit uh, that I am not the most patient person on the planet. Not at all. I'm very impatient. Ask my husband. Like, I don't like waiting for things. I want it done now. Okay, that's just who I am, my personality. Um, I'm wondering, did those 380 people leave because they also couldn't wait? They couldn't handle the uncertainty. Um, They couldn't handle the idea of, well, I don't know what's going to happen. You know, God says to wait for this promise. He didn't tell me what the promise was. He just said, I'm going to give you a promise. Um, I'm going to clothe you with spirit from on high. And, And in that day, like, they're probably like, I mean, I know if I were them, like, what does that even mean? 
Like clothes with spirit from on high. Oh, you're going to give me some clothes, God? Like what, what does it look like? Like in, in the word. And so it's funny to think about that. And so I'm also, um, the 500 were only told that one thing. And, and it was just a command they were given. And they were told to act in obedience. And so my question is what separates the 380 people that left from the 120 that actually stayed in the upper room and waited on God? Um, and I think that those 120 that chose to stay, they had to bring themselves to helplessness, a complete reliance on, on, on God, on the Holy Spirit, a complete reliance on who Jesus was. Because that's the only way they're going to stand, wait, and hang out. Like, what else is there to do? And back then, it's not like it was easy for them to be followers of Jesus because Jesus had just been crucified um, for his belief. And, and so they're waiting on this great promise from God saying, God, you're going to come, right? You're going to come. But it's not an easy thing to wait for. So I feel like in our lives, we can sometimes be like the 380 that left and less like the 120 that stayed. We can sometimes forget because we're impatient, because we're, we have anxiety, because we're scared of God's promises, because we're nervous, because we just don't like the unknown. And I feel like in, even in my life sometimes, I can be like the 380 and less like the 120 that chose to have complete reliance on who God was. And so I want to challenge us this next year um, to live like the 120, embracing every promise God has given and not being afraid of uncertainty, not being afraid of, of what may happen or, or we're not sure what's going to happen. So I want to challenge us to live in the moment of God's promise. And instead of getting impatient and running away, if he promised victory, live in the moment with an attitude of victory. If he promises peace, live in the moment with an attitude of peace. If he promises Joy, live in the moment with an attitude of joy. But the big question is, how do you live in God's promise? What does that look like in your daily life? How do you take that and move on with that? And so the first thing is, don't be afraid to ask. Um, I feel like the 380 left because they were afraid of the unknown. They were afraid to, to wait. They were afraid. They didn't know what was going to happen. But I feel like we sometimes live a life of mediocrity because we're afraid to ask for more. We're afraid to ask for more. We're afraid to wait for more. And we live a life of mediocrity. And I'm not saying God's promise is always big and huge and glamorous. God's promise can be that you're promised tomorrow. That's a promise from God. God's promise can be anything in your life that you know that God's told you. That is God's promise. But we forget about those promises because of fear, because we're afraid to ask for the big things. What are those big dreams you have in your life? What are the big prayers you're afraid to pray because God may just answer them? I think we're afraid that God might answer those prayers. We're like, well, God, I want this and this, but, but maybe I shouldn't ask because maybe he'll answer and then I'll have to deal with it, right? Because sometimes we ask for the big things, but yet we don't see what comes before the big things, right? We're, we don't want God to test our patience. We don't want God to test our uncertainty. We don't want God to test our willingness to be obedient, right? Because we're afraid that what if we don't make the mark? What if we don't measure up, okay? And so... Sometimes we're afraid to ask because it's something that is so small that we're like, God doesn't care. It's so tiny. I just want like 20 bucks for, for this. Okay, I know that's a dumb thing to ask, but can I just say that God cares about the little things? If you're like, I really just want a new blow dryer, and you're praying about it, don't be afraid to ask. Say, God, you know what? I, I really need a new blow dryer. Can you help me out? Um, and I, and I think we forget, like, we're like, man, I just need to blow a dryer, and we complain about it. But then we're like, we serve a God that is almighty and, and promises big things and says that we can do anything and he, we can have anything if we ask for it, right? So what, what about those little things? Why can't we ask for those little things? What's, what's wrong with asking for the small things? Cause, but we are afraid because we're like, you know what, God, you care about the bigger, the bigger. No, God cares about everything, every aspect. doesn't matter how small, doesn't matter how big. God cares about all of it, okay? So don't be fearful to ask because it's maybe too small. When we are afraid to ask for things, it holds us, it holds us back from the promises of God. It holds us back from the promises when we have walk in fear. And God doesn't give you more than you can handle. He doesn't give you more than, than you think you need. God gives you everything that you need to, 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 to do what you need to do. And, and sometimes our promises and God's promises take time to develop. Um, every dream need, needs to be developed. And, but the biggest thing is you don't want to be afraid to start the process, right? You don't want to be afraid to start the process. Um, today when you get a picture developed or, or taking pictures, it's really easy, right? You take a picture with your phone and it's on Facebook in 30 seconds, right? You take a picture, you can go to walgreens.com, post it, and in about, in about an hour you have a picture developed. Um, it was not always that easy. 
I feel like no one, we didn't have, they didn't have Walgreens back in the day where you're like, I, I can get a picture printed in like an hour or I can just take a selfie with my phone and, and put it on my computer and print it right on, at home, right? No, they had to like go through the process of developing their own pictures and they couldn't just drive to a Walgreens to get it developed. It was a process. It took time, it took effort and energy in the same way that a picture takes time to develop, God's plan takes time to develop. God's promise takes time to develop, okay? But sometimes we're afraid to keep going because we're just fearful. We're like, man, God, what if, what if, what if? Man, I'm gonna say that God wants to break that fear because God doesn't want us to live in that fear in our life. It's not what God's called us to do. Look to Jesus, the author and finisher of your faith, is Hebrews 12 too. When you want to walk in fear, when you get to that point where you're like, man, I'm definitely not moving where I need to go because I'm afraid, remember that scripture. Remember that scripture, Hebrews 12 too, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of your faith. If God is the author of your faith and he is the finisher of your faith, it's not about you. So the fear that you have, remember, God is going to take care of it. God's going to hook you up. God's going to make it good for you. God's, you know, not saying your life will be perfect and 100% great and everything will go smoothly, but you don't have to walk in fear or afraid of God's promises because he has good things for you. Second point is do what God leads you to do to live in God's promise. When God gives the big ask, don't be afraid. Don't walk away. Embrace it. Um, we Firstly, we're, you know, we're, we're afraid to ask, and then sometimes God gives us something really big, and then we're like, no, I don't need to walk in that. I'm good. Stay right here in my little comfort zone. Eat my chips. Watch TV. Relax. I don't need to do anything else. I'm good. My life's hunky-dory. I go to work every day. I come home, hang out with my friends, and go to bed. That's my life. I don't need anything more. Sometimes God wants us to do more, though, but I think we're afraid to walk in that. Sometimes God's calling us to do more, but we're afraid to walk in that. I look at the 380 that left, okay, those 380 that weren't in the upper room, I think, man, how dumb must they have felt when they figured out what happened? Because they missed out on something so cool, right? They missed out on this amazing, amazing promise from the Father because they just couldn't hang out a little longer, because they let their own fears and uncertainties and issues deal, get move them away from God's promises. And I'm not saying, I mean, I don't know, the scripture doesn't tell us, but I could imagine if I were them, I would feel a little dumb. I'd look back and be like, man, if only I would have waited a little longer and not just walked away, maybe that would have been an experience for my life too, right? Maybe God would have done something cool in my life in that season as well. Our plan for success looks nothing like God's plan for success. We have to remember that. God, God leads us to things sometimes, and we have a specific way, or we imagine how it should look. We imagine what it should be. And God's saying, why are you, just do what I ask you to do and let me do the rest. Just walk in my promise. Just stand there and say, you know what, God? Yes. Whatever it looks like, yes and amen, right? It doesn't matter how big it is, yes and amen. Um, and sometimes God's promise does not look like the way we expect it to look. Um, I think we can look at other people and we see them living out their dreams. I look at sometimes I know I have a trouble. Sometimes I struggle uh, being a female pastor. I look at other people and think, man, if I just was better at this or better at that or better at that, maybe, you know, I look at my life and sometimes I compare myself and think I'm inadequate, but then I realize that, that my promise from God is not the same as somebody else's promise from God, and it doesn't look the same way, okay? The comparison doesn't mean anything because it doesn't, it's not about me. It's about what God's doing in me, not about what it looks like to me, if that makes sense. Um, your promise will always look different than somebody else's promise. It's not going to look the same because we're different people. God created different beings, but you will impact different people. You will have experiences with different people, and, and God did that on purpose, there's a reason no one's fingerprint is the same, right? We all have different fingerprints. If we were all supposed to be the same, God would have created us all exactly alike. We'd have been robots for him, right? Um, so when I moved, so I moved to Arizona when I was 21 years old. I'm 30 now, so nine years ago. Um, when I moved to Arizona, um, I did not want to move to Arizona. That was not my plan, okay? I was in Las Vegas where I grew up. I was doing an internship program, a school of ministry, and I had just graduated. Um, two of my youth pastors had moved here to Arizona to, um, to take over a youth ministry um, in uh, Glendale, 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 Arizona. And they're like, you should come down and help us out. And I was like, why would I do that? That's dumb. And they were like, you should just come help us out. And because I had graduated from my internship, and I was kind of just chilling, hanging out, going to church, and kind of figuring out what was next, you know. Um, I was doing Berean School of the Bible to get my credentials with the Assemblies of God. 
I knew I wanted to be a youth pastor. I knew what God had called me to do, but I didn't know where to go from there. And so they're like, they asked me, I would say once a month, so you're going to come down? And no, I don't know anybody. There's no, why? There's no reason for me to move. Like, you're crazy. And so they continued um, to badger me about it and badger me about it. And then eventually God started working on my heart, okay? And then eventually it turned out to where if I didn't move to Arizona, I was going to be homeless. Like God literally took everything from Las Vegas that was in my life and pulled it and ripped it away. So all that was left was move to Arizona or live on the street. So I said, all right, God, move to Arizona. Moved to Arizona, and I was like, I know two people in this state. This is terrible. Um, I'm a social person. I like people. I like to hang out with people. My husband and I are very opposite in that. He, he, he regenerates by being alone. I regenerate by being around lots of people and socializing and hanging out. Like, I want to talk to everybody. Um, and so for me to move to a state where I knew two people, two people, I was like, God, this is not a good plan. Not a good plan at all. And so I moved here. Um, and, and I will say, you know, uh, doing what God leads you to do, like, it, best thing I could have done for my life was to move to Arizona, 100%. But back then, that's not what I thought. Okay, back then, I remember being, I was depressed. I had not found a job yet. I had no friends. I was like, it was like a month in, and I like, my, even my, the people I was living with, the pastors that I moved here with, I was living with them. And they were like, they even were like, you know, if you need to go back, you can go back. Because, like, I was that depressed. Like, they were, like, worried about me. Like, I was, I was, I had no friends. I would literally be sitting on the couch just watching TV by myself. Like, I was bored. I was like, this is terrible. I have no people, no one to talk to. Um, I eventually got a job, and, and God slowly started working on my heart. And I, we, we started helping out. I started helping out the church more and helping them out more. And it became, I got friends. And, and it changed for me. But the beginning of that, 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 Obedience, the beginning of, of doing what God led me to do, doing what I was supposed to do, was terrible. It was not fun. It was not the greatest thing. And so um, the, the promise of, of the, this promise, the obedience I had to do to receive this promise was hard because I felt like I was just hanging out in a pit by myself. I'm not going to compare myself to Joseph because that guy was rough. He was in a pit for a long time. But, like, I think about it sometimes. I'm like, God, I was just chilling in that pit by myself, real bored. Um, didn't have any friends. I was like, what the heck? Um, but it, it never, if I had moved, if I did not move and if I had stayed where I was in my comfort zone, I can think like, like what would have God done? Like, what would I have missed out on? What promises? Like I met my husband here, you know, I uh, grew in ministry here. I, I mean, there's so many things God has done in my life in Arizona that probably never would have happened had I had just stayed where I was at because I was afraid to do what God told me to do. Because I was happy being where I was. I was very happy in my comfort zone. I was happy with my friends. Um, and, and understanding that. But God's leading does not always make sense. And sometimes it feels more like you're in a big pit than you're actually living a great dream, right? You're like, oh, I'm living the dream. Sometimes you're not living the dream. Sometimes you're just like, I'm trying to live, but I'm real frustrated. Okay, this dream is not really working out. Um, and so it's, it's, it's frustrating, but God, God does bigger. God does more. And, and I look at the bigger picture now that I see nine years living here. I look at this picture and think, man, God, what you've done in nine years of my life would have never happened if I would have stayed where I was at, right? Never would, I would never be here with you guys. I would never have met my husband, you know, having a daughter. Like so many things God's done in my life. And, and it's all because of my obedience, right? It's because I chose to say yes to God's leading in my life. Third thing is to speak God's promise and blessings into your life. Um, it's, I a term to speak life, right? You know, speak life. That's a term that people use often. Um, it's true. Speak good things into your life, and you'll see good things come to pass. Um, negative people don't get anywhere. Okay, negative people they just they live in negativity, and then they surround themselves with negative people, and they don't go anywhere. Um, scripture tells us to speak to those things that are not as though they are. Um, this does not apply only to physical things, but the things we desire. It applies also to the promises in our lives, the things that God's told us, right? If God said that you're going to have this in five years and you don't see it in five years, that doesn't mean God forgot. That just means God's like, you know what? You're going to wait a little longer. But that promise will still be fulfilled. That promise doesn't change. But sometimes the promise takes longer. Sometimes it's not always on what we think, our time, right? And even though we don't see the promise, we should speak to those promises as though they are a reality. 
Jeremiah 29, 11 says, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and to, not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. We need to live in the moment of God's promise, okay? Live in the moment of who God's called us to be. The difference between the 380 that left and the 120 that stayed in the upper room is they chose to live in God's promise and speak faith instead of walking away from the unknown, instead of walking away from what they couldn't see. You may not always see the light at the end of the tunnel and become impatient waiting, but speak life into a bad situation. A dream that you thought was dead, speak life into that and you will see blessings in your life as you live in the promise of God. Um, sometimes life kind of stinks. Been there. Life sucks sometimes. It's terrible for most of us sometimes. Um, I, I go through seasons where I'm like, man, Jesus, really? Like, I love you, but can you just a little easier? A little easier for me. Um, and being in ministry and being a pastor, it does not change that. Life still sucks sometimes. And you still go through seasons where life kind of beats you up. And you have things happen. And, you know, people that are in ministry, it's not like they're all blessed and everything's perfect in their lives and everything goes well. No, not even a little bit, okay? It's frustrating sometimes. And I went through a season this last year, of a short season. It wasn't very long, but it was a short season where life was just beating me up. And I remember I... It's, it was a struggle to wake up every day and go to work. It was a struggle to do the things that I love to do. It was a struggle to write a sermon. It was a struggle to just, like, be sociable with people. Like, it was just like, God, I'm just frustrated, and I just want to stay in my bed and sleep. That's all I want to do, because I'm just, I know that you're good, and I know that you're great, and I know that you're mighty, but life has just been terrible, and things have just gone wrong. And I remember living in that season where it's like I forgot to dream. I forgot that God had dreams in my life, and I allowed myself to, for, for a minute, forget that, you know what, God's promises are still good, and it's still yes and amen, and I still had dreams, and, and I think sometimes in our lives we can allow life to beat the dreams out of us. We can allow life to just punch the dreams out of us, and we're just like at a point where we're just a shell of people, because we're like, you know what, God, you have bigger promises. You know what, God, you're better. But we allow life to beat us up to the point where we forget about God's promises. We forget that God has more for us. We forget the dreams that God has for each one of us are bigger and better than we can imagine for ourselves because we've allowed life to just beat it out of us, right? We've allowed life to beat it out of us. And it's crazy that those 120 people that God used to change the world, God used them to change the world and they had no idea. They had no idea what their obedience was going to do. They had no idea by saying yes to that dream or yes to that promise what their obedience did for so many people. And I think you and I are the same. We have no idea what our obedience will do for somebody else. We have no idea what our obedience will do for ourselves. You don't know what when you say yes to that promise, what is it going to bring forth? We don't know because God does not tell us. God does not always give us the big picture, right? He just says, do this, and we say yes. He says, do that, and we say yes. He says, go here, and we say, okay, Jesus. But he never tells us the whole thing, right? Because, because God wants us to walk in his promises and his victory. Living in God's promise and running towards the things that he tells us to instead of shrinking in fear because it seems like too much. Today, I want, we're going to go into time of communion and prayer here in a minute. And, and I want you guys to imagine for this next year that you're one of the 120 waiting on God. And what are you waiting for? Like, they were waiting for a promise from the Father. They were waiting for something. But I want you to look at your life in this last year and say, you know what? God, maybe it wasn't great. Maybe it wasn't perfect. But in this next year, what are you waiting for? What are you praying for? What are you not praying for? Because you're afraid, right? What, what prayers are you not saying? What dreams are you not, not proving? What dreams are you not walking in? Why, why aren't you asking the big asks, right? But more than anything, what are you dreaming for? What, are you, what promises are you waiting for for this next year? Because this next year, 2018, let it be the best year you have ever had in your life, right? Let it be the best year and live in God's promise and walk in God's promise because it's not about it's about you and I, yes, but at the end of the day, it's about Jesus, right? God's promised us so much, but yet we forget, and we forget that we don't rely on ourselves. Because it's easy to think that, well, I have to do it myself. I have to figure it out. No, we don't, actually. We just say yes to Jesus and let him do the rest. God says, do this, you say, okay, okay. 
And one step after another, you keep walking, right? And eventually you're going to be led to that big dream, that big promise that God has for your life. And this next year, strive to be like the 120. Not afraid to say yes to God, even in the unknown. Even in the unknown. If the worship team can go and come on up, we're going to go ahead and start in a minute. The 120 in the upper room chose to wait on God's promise. We need to do the same because, guys, a delayed dream is not a forgotten dream. A delayed promise is not a forgotten promise. It's, enough, it's a matter of us trusting God enough to know that he will do what he says he will do. I think that's where we struggle is, do we trust God enough to know that he's going to do what he said he will do? God's not a God that would lie. He's not a father that would lie to each one of us. So I want you guys to stand up for me really quick. We're going to go into time of prayer and worship, and we're going to have the communion tables open. We'll have a couple people up here to pray if you need prayer for anything. Um, but I want to encourage you, and I say this generally anytime I preach, just because for me personally, I think sometimes it's hard. For me, it's hard to stay in my chair. And, and, and sometimes I need to get out of my comfort zone, right? I need to walk out from where I'm sitting and allow myself to, to hear from God put myself in a position to hear from God. So I want to encourage you in this next song, put yourself in a position to hear from God. Put yourself in a position where you're out of your comfort zone. If your neighbor, if you're distracted by your neighbor, walk away from your neighbor and find a spot either at this altar, find a spot in this room where you can just be alone with Jesus and begin to pray and begin to ask God those big asks. Begin to seek the promises of God for your life because it doesn't start tomorrow right? Let's end this year thinking of what are the promises God has for my life and how can I walk in those promises and how can God use me in those promises and what's God's plan for this and what do you called me to do here, God? And I think we need to ask the big asks. So we're going to go ahead and begin our time of worship and I want to encourage you, find a spot at the altar, find a spot in your chair where you really commune with God. Don't just stand there and walk out of this room the same way you came in, but leave this room different than when you walked in. Ready to fulfill the things God's called you to fulfill and be obedient to those things. Jesus, you are faithful and you are good, Father, and you are amazing, Jesus. Lord, we lift you up. I want everyone to lift their hands in the room for me really fast. Lord, I pray for each person in this room right now. I pray, Lord, Holy Spirit, you speak to each one of us. I pray, God, that we are, we are God, giving ourselves to you in this next moment, God. We are, God, of surrendering, God, all of our own thoughts and our own desires and saying, God, use us as you will call us to use, God. I pray that you speak, God, dreams and promises to each person in this room, that they will walk out of here, God, feeling, God, knowing, God, that you've called them to something more and bigger, Lord, and that you've called us, God, to be your bearers, God, and your, your sons and your daughters, Lord. And we love you, Lord, and we praise you, God. And we ask that you move mightily in this house today, Lord. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.